of efficiency and evolution of architecture from what I had the efficiency and uh, sort of the part of collaborating with him, uh, uh, to understand what we can do at the soft, at the level of the software in order to uh, exploit the, the feature that could allow to uh, save energy using the uh, modern uh, CPU. Connected with my. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So let me get started uh, with the, uh, the presentation. is going to be very much hardware centric, not so much uh, on the application. Uh, so this uh, uh, this is going to be uh, the outline. I think I will uh, go very fast on the first part because I'm guess I'm preaching to the converted, uh, and then I'll. Uh, uh, go into some more details on the work that we have done on uh, um, power and thermal management and monitoring. And uh, uh, I will uh, close with some uh, conclusion on uh, future uh, energy efficient hardware. So essentially the problem that we have is that we project uh, exascale computing uh, will have unreasonable power budgets. Uh, this is uh, improving with technology, with uh, better architecture and so on, but it's still, uh, uh, you know, um, quite far from the target for exascale. So we need uh, uh, almost an order of magnitude more energy efficiency uh, from the platform, but also we have to consider that uh, cooling is in the picture. Uh, cooling is uh, uh, problematic, is increasingly problematic, and adds up to the overall power budget. So essentially, uh, we need to worry about average power um, over quite a long time constants, uh, and this uh, brings the problem of uh, uh, dynamic power management for the system, the node, and the architecture. This is not the only problem. We also have a maximum power problem. Um, with uh, scaling technologies, there is more and more heterogeneity uh, also in terms of fabrication uh, on the chips. And on the same die, for example, uh, we can have uh, very significant thermal gradients uh, created by the workload, but also created by uh, the variability uh, on, uh, on the chips themselves. Uh, this is uh, true at a larger time scale, uh, larger space, a spatial scale on the HPC system. If uh, your cooling uh, uh, is not uh, completely perfect and uh, your machines are also not uh, equally work uh, loaded, you can have uh, uh, quite significant uh, thermal gradients in your uh, in your system, and this actually brings uh, the need to uh, actually power cap uh, locally your uh, machines or your chips. Uh, to meet uh, the maximum thermal budgets. We call this uh, issue uh, dynamic thermal management. So just to uh, clarify, this is uh, dynamic power management and dynamic uh, power, uh, thermal management are multi-scale problems. So they are uh, present on the chip. They are present on the compute node, on the rack, and the HPC, HPC cluster, and also they have in, uh, interaction with uh, the cooling. So this is actually what we have been working on in my uh, ERC projects, trying to develop a strategy that goes uh, across the various layers to have a multi-scale uh, thermal and power management. Uh, the, uh, from the point of view of uh, the workload, uh, the architecture uh, of the workload is the, the way we architect our uh, machines. So there is a higher level um, uh, scheduling model where the various jobs are dispatched on the machines, and uh, also there is a programming model. So today I'm, I'm mostly going to consider MPI-based uh, uh, programming model, which is quite pervasive, and the uh, patterns of communications that you have in terms of uh, synchronization, broadcast, uh, gather, and scatter and reduction. And uh, understanding, having an interaction between the power, the power management, thermal management, and the programming scheduling model is quite essential to uh, get the best results. So it's not only a hardware problem, but it's really a vertical hardware software problem. So uh, looking at what we have uh, done in this area, 
uh, first of all, we needed to uh, look into what uh, you can uh, play to do uh, power and thermal modeling. So essentially, the knobs you have are in terms of uh, frequency control. Here I'm using uh, the uh, CPU uh, terminology, Intel CPU terminology, but uh, most of the uh, hardware that you use in high performance computing has similar um, control uh, knobs. So the first is the uh, dynamic voltage and frequency uh, setting that uh, where core by core you can actually decide on the trade-off between performance and uh, of course power uh, playing with voltage and frequency. And, uh, and you have a set of states that in uh, uh, Intel terminology are called P states where you can play with them. Then there is also the uh, managing of the idleness. So in case you have uh, um, long periods of idle time, you can also use the uh, C states where actually you sh uh, shut down or shut off a part of the resources using various uh, uh, levels of aggressiveness uh, in terms of shutting down. And uh, uh, the larger the saving, the longer is the time to go back to work. And so the longer is the penalty for duty cycling in and out of the uh, deeper sleep uh, C states. So uh, most of this currently is uh, uh, supported in, uh, through a hardware abstraction that is uh, uh, called uh, for Intel Raffle, where essentially uh, you provide what you, you ask what you need from the machine. For example, you provide a power cap, and the machine will use this type of states trying to meet your, uh, your target in terms of power. So now we did. Uh, uh, the, quite a lot of work in understanding how this uh, um, type of uh, controller work. And they actually uh, work uh, in hardware using some sort of a reactive control uh, knob. So essentially what happens is that you have a limit here that is uh, induced by thermal or uh, average power. And the, and the controller will try to settle uh, using feedback control around uh, the limit. And you have the usual problems of uh, um, overshooting when you hit the limit and then you have to control back and you have the problem of settling uh, and uh, the stability versus accuracy trade-off is uh, uh, quite serious. So essentially this is uh, uh, what uh, you will see. It's not really ideal. These controllers are not uh, reacting instantaneously to what you need. So uh, we did a lot of work in uh, moving from uh, this type of reactive control to more predictive control. And uh, predictive uh, uh, can be done at various uh, time scales. So uh, at the hardware level, essentially, you replace this type of uh, threshold-based uh, um, contr feedback controls with uh, what we call the, um, model predictive control. Essentially, model predictive control is based on creating a model of your hardware so a model based, uh, for example, on approximate compact, compact models of how the thermal distribution of the chip uh, will uh, change over uh, different workloads or over different uh, base temperature conditions. So you create a model uh, of your uh, workload. This is, for example, based on uh, um, finite uh, models, uh, RC-based uh, approach. And then uh, based on, on this model, you can actually uh, get more longer term type of prediction of what is uh, coming along with uh, the, as the workload uh, will change and how and the dynamics of your uh, thermal system will uh, change the temperatures. So in, uh, just to give you an idea, on the chip, uh, this uh, uh, thermal model horizon in the, is in the order of a few seconds or a few from the milliseconds to the seconds. And uh, of course, this type of approach scales up also to rack and uh, to the full uh, data center scale. In this case, your time constants for your model prediction give you a uh, room for prediction in the, in, the t in the orders of several tens of seconds to minutes. And if you go to the full uh, data center scales, even uh, in, the, uh, in the order of several minutes. And this actually gives you a lot of uh, headroom to try to plan ahead what you're going to do with the machine. Uh, instead of just reacting to thermal and power emergencies. So for example, uh, at, a, at a full uh, uh, data uh, center scale, you can actually use a predictive model in the order of the duration of the entire job. And in this case, you have to have some sort of average power duration for your average power prediction of your job. And then uh, essentially try to uh, use this model that you create for your jobs to uh, direct the scheduling on the jobs on the machine. So for example, you can uh, uh, schedule the jobs to account, for, of course, for 
uh, requirements in uh, timeliness and so on, but also to account for the power cap. And this type of predictive power modeling uh, pro, um, provides better utilization of your machine and uh, also allows you to uh, manage power capping both for thermal and for uh, power saving regions. Now, overall, this uh, work that we have done uh, in the past essentially requires as uh, um, has essentially this, uh, the usual uh, trade-off between uh, hardware and software. Uh, software is, uh, uh, has, can decide on more, but it's slow, and hardware is uh, more focused and cannot decide on much more because it doesn't have a lot of visibility on the future, but it's much faster. And to uh, support this, you need low overhead accurate monitoring, scalable data collection, uh, and uh, analytics and decisions, and application level awareness. So um, let me cover a little bit about what we have done recently on this type of uh, uh, requirements. So in terms of low overhead accurate monitoring, so currently what you have is uh, this type of uh, profiling of your workload and your, your thermal and power behavior, which is on the order of uh, sampling times of one second. Actually, uh, to improve the accuracy of what uh, you see of the machine, you would like to go into uh, you know, milliseconds type of profiling so that you can track power, thermal emergencies, and all these type of things. Uh, and so if you want to boost your sampling rate by several orders of magnitude to be able to track what is going on on all the levels of the machine, you have to deal with uh, much more aggressive specification in terms of sampling rate and in terms of amount of data produced and, uh, need, and that we need to track. You can even be more aggressive, and this is, for example, is uh, the uh, looking in frequency to what happens to your hardware. This is the Fourier transform, real-time frequency analysis of a power supply. And this is actually extremely interesting because by doing the frequency analysis of your power supply, you can, for example, detect the characteristic of the applications. You can also detect uh, in a very predictive way, in a very robust way, which nodes are actually not performing according to expectations. You can look at the moving of the peaks to see changing in workload and also changing in your hardware, uh, and uh, such as uh, slow deteriorations and things like that. But this, of course, uh, requires uh, very, high, uh, very, very high sampling frequency and has to be done at the scale of the entire data center. So to support this high frequency monitoring and high precision monitoring, we, uh, we have developed what we call the dwarf in a giant solution. Essentially, is uh, uh, provide embedded power monitor on the nodes of your machines, and then uh, get the data collection and feeding this to a database that uh, does the aggregation process, learn, and analyzing. Of course, uh, if you talk about the high frequency that we have, we have discussed before, you need a huge amount of data to be filtered here. So you need a very scalable infrastructure. But at the limit, uh, this is not sustainable. And so in many cases, what you want to do is to partition your data analytics uh, on the machines, not all on the, on the cloud, let's say, database, on the database that is monitoring the machine, but also uh, spread the part of the computation on the embedded platform that is actually uh, monitoring the machine. Uh, so this is actually the, uh, the node, and actually what uh, you, um, you add here is a small um, tens of dollars uh, embedded board that is capable of uh, getting the data but also processing the data. And this is uh, uh, the, and actually this is the deployment at scale on the Davide computer that uh, is now in, uh, and actually this, uh, this is a very small uh, uh, big oven black embedded board that costs a few tens of dollars and uh, uh, is deployed on a node by node level. So what uh, this machine does is actually has a dedicated current sensor and does the monitoring of the overall uh, node power consumption and it has sufficient on-chip resources uh, to actually be able to uh, do edge computing and also some uh, uh, basic form of learning on the power models that you have on the machine. It, uh, uh, it is quite platform independent because it's added on the master board. We have uh, demonstrated it on Intel, IBM, and ARM. It has a sub-watt precision and is very high uh, sampling rate, up to several tens of kilo samples per second, which is uh, uh, several orders of magnitude with, uh, better than the res with respect to the uh, state of the art, even the uh, most advanced machines that reach the uh, one millisecond, which would be a one kilohertz. What is also interesting is that this is a multi-core platform, uh, of course, a much simpler cores than the one that you have in the main machine. It also has a real-time processor 
And this real-time processor can be used actually to extract, uh, uh, to compute uh, with very high timing precision things like a Fourier transform or uh, averaging or filtering of your power profile. And this also um, offloads the ARM processor uh, that will only be in charge of the communication with the rest of the system. So just to give you an idea what uh, the uh, Dwarf in a Giant solution provides is uh, essentially uh, you can provide the uh, monitoring up to the uh, 5 kilohertz. You can also do edge analysis and you can also um, do uh, fast Fourier type of transform uh, edge analysis. You can also do simpler analysis like averaging or uh, peak detection and things like that. And, and you can see the uh, order of uh, magnitude with respect to uh, the fastest measurement system available today in uh, uh, standard machines it is uh, several orders of magnitude higher. Um, one important, important point, if you project this on a multi-node setup, is the time synchronization between, between the various measurements that you get. And uh, with uh, time synchronization based on NTP or on PTP, we can actually get the time samples out of the system with the time resolution that is of the order of microsec microseconds, which actually is uh, uh, fine grain enough to actually uh, uh, see things happening on a large scale system and uh, like phases of the application across various nodes with very much, uh, very, very high precision here. Now, on the other side of the, uh, of the collection uh, uh, data, all these are the, the sensor node that I mentioned, the um, dwarf in a giant sensor nodes, and these are actually projecting uh, data uh, into a big data type of uh, uh, scalable uh, uh, monitoring infrastructure based on open source uh, um, big data uh, tools. So MQTT is a standard protocol that we use for the sensor to communicate uh, value and timestamps to uh, a, a collection that is the broker, and the broker will uh, uh, you know, feed the uh, samples to a subscriber. And the subscriber is nothing else than a database entity that subscribes to the information channels that are produced by the, uh, by the um, various nodes and distributes that into a, a column uh, type of database uh, that can be used to, uh, with the time series front end to analyze uh, what is uh, being collected by this distributed infrastructure. This is the, the typical uh, uh, use that you have here, which is essentially you collect the data, you store it in a column database, and then you perform searches and analytics on uh, the data that has been uh, stored and for a you know, one week or two or three weeks time window, depending on how much storage you can afford. The other um, more, let's say, advanced flow is actually to perform string analytics uh, directly on the data coming from the brokers. These two uh, flows are not uh, uh, mutually exclusive. Actually, they, they can be applied at the same time. And uh, we do this with the Spark, with the memory um, type of uh, stream-based computing. So this is the Spark flow. The data comes, it's uh, taken from, uh, from a in a buffer, it's uh, clustered, and then uh, this uh, uh, is actually used to create, for example, a power model or predictive model. And this becomes, if you want, a virtual sensor that can produce, uh, again, data or digest data. And then this data can be uh, subscribed by a higher level database that will uh, uh, not need to get all the data, but only the data out after the filtering uh, from the stream processor. So we can apply some sort of a hierarchical filtering of the data in, uh, in the node, but also uh, on the global scale. So this infrastructure is uh, uh, deployed in um, Galileo uh, and actually is uh, uh, producing data at, a at uh, around uh, you know, one tera uh, byte per week. And uh, of course, uh, if we project this to a full scale machine, uh, even larger tier zero machine, we will have 10 terabytes in half a week. So stream analytics and the distributed process are really a necessity with this type of data. So with this information, we can perform a, a lot of application-aware uh, type of energy-to-solution minimization. For example, uh, we have done some work on Quantum Espresso, uh, analyzing the, uh, with a very fine grain the idleness in, uh, in the application. So just uh, um, we have done this by uh, adding monitoring, uh, similar monitoring uh, infrastructure to uh, the MPI calls. And this is actually a very low overhead instrumentation on the MPI that doesn't really need to change the code. It's just 
uh, embedded in the MPI course uh, themselves. And then you can uh, uh, have information about uh, uh, application time and MPI time at a very fine grain uh, with a, a very minimal overhead. So with this type of uh, application, that is uh, actually, this type of monitoring is actually very um, accurate, you can get data like this one, where you can see, for example, on a run on a, of, uh, um, of Quantum Espresso, where, uh, you know, here is a single node run with, with NDAG uh, equal to one. You see that there is a lot of time spent in the MPI because it's actually unbalanced workload. If you go on NDAG 16, parallelizing diagonalization, you see that this is going uh, much better, but you still have uh, some uh, idle time. So we actually explored how you could uh, uh, get, uh, uh, exploit this idle time to improve your energy efficiency. And essentially the idea would be to actually uh, apply an application aware uh, voltage scaling and frequency scaling where you are, when you are waiting on the MPI synchronization, you actually slow down your, your processor here and you wake up uh, and you accelerate when you are in the application phase. Uh, the idea is that here you will save power. The challenge is that these transitions take time, and if you do it on a very fine grain uh, uh, idle times, you'll actually uh, decrease the performance of your application. So this actually shows what happens in, uh, in practice. You see that how this uh, type of profiling of the, your phases of the application is useful because we have that in the case of NDAG equals 16, you can get uh, 12% uh, uh, percent power saving, 11% percent of energy savings without uh, any uh, slowdown in your, uh, in your application. The case is not the same when you are highly balanced. You have uh, very uh, minimal savings and you have to be very careful because if you do um, uh, power management on too fine grain, you are actually getting a, a slowdown on your overall application. So again, this type of uh, fine grain monitoring, high precision monitoring is useful to do this type of uh, recoveries. So let me close with a few um, um, slides about uh, what we can think about uh, doing next. This is energy efficient hardware. So, so far I talk about what, how we can improve the utilization of the machine and how, let's see how we can improve the machine itself. So the, the, the big message that has been already given today is that uh, there is a massive presence of accelerators and uh, uh, you know, absolute dominance of accelerator in the Green 500. The reason why accelerator deliver from the hardware viewpoint better energy efficiency is uh, have already been explained. Many thousands of simple cores that maximize the floating point per millimeter square. Uh, uh, in a sense, less uh, legacy oriented and simpler memory hierarchy, uh, not so uh, strictly bound to coherence and so on, that actually improve the amount of memory that you can use uh, in a useful way on a chip. And um, large memory bandwidth, uh, by tightly coupled memories and low operating voltage and relatively moderate operating frequency uh, that uh, keeps the watt per millimeter square under control and migration gradually from uh, uh, 2D uh, to 3D in terms of uh, uh, attaching memories to the, to the cores. So is there room for differentiation over these ideas with respect to GPGPUs or GPGPUs are already doing it perfectly? That is the only answer. So there is uh, some hope, there is, uh, you know, some um, interesting chips that have been uh, presented. For example, the PESI SC2, which actually in November 16, 17 achieved one, two, three uh, top scores in Green 500. Uh, and essentially, uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, there, were, there were several optimization performed on this uh, As you can see, I'm, you know, for the lack of time, I'm not going to cover uh, these in details, but essentially the key idea is that it combines a low power design, a very simple, no legacy instruction set, and uh, advanced power management. So it's some sort of a machine created from scratch from energy efficiency and not derived through many iterations to become more energy efficient. So uh, is there an opportunity to do something here? And the message I have is that in, indeed uh, uh, it looks like we are at a point where there is an opportunity. So um, there has been a lot of interest uh, lately on open source uh, instruction set architectures. Uh, risk five is an open instruction set architecture. This is the first time this uh, really happens. So this uh, is instruction set that you can use without paying royalties uh, to any uh, company that has developed the instruction set. And this uh, uh, is uh, uh, sponsored by a foundation, is supported by foundations that includes all the largest, uh, uh, many of the largest vendors, hardware vendors, and uh, 
it is a very reasonable uh, streamlined uh, instruction set architecture. Uh, distilled many years of uh, uh, research uh, and is conceived really for efficiency and not to support legacy uh, work. It is a safe use and free, so you can develop your own hardware based on these things. It has a, a wide community, already many companies supporting it, and is rapidly gaining traction in many applications like IoT and big data. And also some companies are already starting to look into high performance profile implementation of chips based on this instruction set architecture. So what we did in my group, in the hardware side of the group, we actually work on uh, uh, actually bringing open source hardware implementation of this, uh, uh, of this hardware with the support that you need and a uh, solder pad license, which essentially is a, a, you know, a free for commercial use license. And this uh, type of uh, hardware IPs are already used by several companies commercially in the IoT space and are starting to be looked at uh, at the high performance space. So the, essentially the basic idea is to democratize hardware as we have democratized the software, uh, like uh, Quantum Express is a, is a very good idea. This the type of chips, uh, uh, these processors are already implemented in quite advanced technologies. The latest type out we have done is in 22 FDX, which is more or less equivalent in terms of performance to the technologies used by the, uh, P, the, the Pascal class GPUs. Okay. So this concludes my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.